This is the 15th year of Access Conference. It's called Access Conference because our student ministry here at the Life Church is called Access, not Access, Access. And the word Access means a point on which something centers on or revolves around. So the goal of Access Conference every year is for each and every one of us to be inspired to put Jesus and his church at the center of our worlds so that everything else in our lives revolves around him. And each year we have a, a spiritual theme for the conference, a word or phrase that becomes the banner over that particular year. This year, if you haven't figured it out yet, the, the, the theme for 2024 is the word overflow. Everybody say overflow. And our theme verse is in John chapter 10, 10. And uh, you saw a little bit of it in that opener. It says this, The thief comes only in order to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have and enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. There's a big theme you have to understand about life on this earth. There are going to always be two forces fighting for your life, for your future, for your purpose. You have an enemy. His name is Satan. He's real. He's not really messing around. He's not here to hang out and have some fun. He has one single mission. He wants to steal your joy, kill your dreams, destroy any chance at a true satisfying life that you have. On the other hand, we have a savior named Jesus, who by his own declaration has a mission that's completely opposite of that of his enemy. Jesus wants you to have life. And not just breath in your lungs, kind of existing life. He wants you to have real life, abundant life, a life that's actually enjoyable, that's filled with joy, a life that actually overflows. And so here's the heart of this year's theme. Jesus wants your life to overflow. He wants your life to overflow with joy. He wants your life to overflow with peace. He wants your life to overflow with purpose, with love. He wants your life to overflow with satisfaction. You would be so full in him that it would actually fill you up enough to spill out into the environments you go into, to impact the people that you encounter, to spread into your church and your school and your city and your home. Imagine if we had a couple thousand teenagers leave Access Conference 2024 overflowing with joy. I think it could change our world. Because when you look around, it's easy to think that we often live uh, uh, in a world that seems pretty dark and depressing and evil and maybe even joyless, but we're called to be different than the world. And here's the problem. Here's why I would say I'm so passionate about this idea of overflow. When I look at the world today, when I look at young people today, and even those who are not so young, I don't see many people overflowing with life and joy. In fact, I see the opposite. I see people empty, depressed, thirsty. Forget overflow. For most of the world, there's no flow at all. There's nothing. And if Jesus offers a life to us that's overflowing with joy, why are so few people experiencing it? I think I know why. And my prayer is that by the end of this night and by the end of this week, some of you will go to, from empty to overflowing because of the encounter you have with Jesus Christ at this conference. And so tonight, I want to start with a simple premise, a, 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 a simple idea, a starting point for overflow that I think all of us can easily understand because before you can experience overflow, you have to first be filled. Before something can overflow, right, it has to be filled with a substance that doesn't run out or fade away. And I think there are a lot of people here tonight that aren't walking in overflow because what you're filling your life with doesn't actually fill you. The sources you're turning to for joy and satisfaction are actually making you more depressed. And I'm not okay with that. And I know we have a lot of youth pastors in the room that are not okay with that. And I know for a fact our God in heaven is not okay with that. And so let's believe God together that something will change in each of us tonight and this week. I've titled the first message of Access Conference 2024, It's Time to Try Something New. It's time to try something new. Let's pray, and then let's get into it. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you're going to speak to us tonight. We have no doubts that you're in the place, and you have great plans for each and every one of us. So, Lord, we tune out distractions. We open up our hearts, our minds, our ears. Lord, whatever you want to do, we say have your way. If you want to convict us, convict us. If you want to encourage us, encourage us. If you want to challenge us, challenge us. Whatever you want to do, we say have your way. And Lord, we take a minute right here in advance and praise you for the bounce back year the Memphis Grizzlies are going to have in 2024, 2025 when they win the NBA championship. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, one thing about me that you got to know is uh, I don't like to try new things. Um, I don't like to 
really get out of my comfort zone. I, I, I like to drink the same things, eat the same things, go to the same places, do the same things, wear the same things. I mean, look at my outfit tonight. I got white shoes, black pants, and a white shirt. And this is the biggest, baggiest shirt I have in my closet, all right? I'm trying to be cool, but it's a stretch. I don't feel comfortable in this big, baggy shirt because I don't like to try new things. I don't like to wear new things. I like to kind of keep it simple, keep it in my little box. I'm not cool enough to be adventurous. And there's pros and cons to that. I'm not necessarily saying that's a good or bad thing, but it's just a fact. Unfortunately, though, I may have passed on some of the worst parts of this trait to my five-year-old son, Leo. And it shows up primarily in his diet. He pretty much only eats five things. Chicken, rice, french fries, yogurt, and apples. Those five things and no more. His food pyramid is not made up of categories. It's made up of five items. Chicken, rice, french fries, yogurt, and thank God, some apples. And we're working on it. He's picky. He gets it from me. Um, but if I'm going to be transparent tonight, I, I want to tell you about what I think is a little bit of a, a pa parenting failure we've had with Leo specifically. Not with our other two kids because we learned the lesson, but with him, we messed up. Far too early in life, we, inter we introduced him to a drink called lemonade. Now, lemonade is delicious without question. It's a solid drink option, especially on a hot summer day or with some Chick-fil-A. just hits, all right? It's a good drink. But it's got a lot of sugar, and it's not the healthiest drink option for a five-year-old, and it's all Leo is willing to drink. No exaggeration. He will not drink anything else. And so now we have a bit of an issue. We have a full-blown lemonade addict that lives in our home. A lemon head, if you will. And it's bad. He doesn't drink anything else. And I try uh, to help him. For over a year now, we've been trying to wean him off his addiction to lemonade. Now when we give him a drink, it's 90% water and 10% lemonade. It's disgusting. But if he doesn't get that hint of lemonade, he's out. He's not going to drink it. So I beg him, just drink water, man. I explain how much better it is for him, how lemonade isn't really that good for you. You shouldn't drink so much. It's bad for your teeth, bad for your health. Water is going to actually satisfy your thirst way better anyway. But he tells me he hates water. I don't know how anybody could hate water, but he's passionate about it. He says it doesn't taste good. It smells bad. He doesn't like how it looks. And you know what he told me the other day? Water tastes like rotten beans. What the heck are rotten beans? I've never even heard of that. This dude has a generational hate for, for water. And just like me, he won't try anything new. Even though there's actually a better, more satisfying, more healthy drink option out there, he's so addicted to his lemonade, he won't make the switch. So you got to pray for us. When you read the Bible, there are a lot of metaphor that connects water to the presence of God. All over the Bible, the refreshing flowing, strong rush, rush of water is a brilliant example of what happens when the presence of God fills our lives. Water is also a great, easy example to understand when it comes to overflow, right? I could take a cup right here, pour a pitcher of water into it, it would fill up and then clearly overflow. In fact, another great overflow verse is found in Psalm 23, where the writer declares, because of God, my cup overflows. To take it a step further, one of the most famous encounters Jesus ever had centers around someone drinking water. It's a story I want to use as our outline tonight because I think what Jesus teaches in this story applies directly to where many of us are in this room tonight. And it's a very common story. I would be surprised if you haven't heard a message on this story. Uh, the point is not a new story, but I do believe that it's the right story at the right time in the right season of life at the right conference for your life tonight. So I want you to lean in, even if you know the story, and see what God wants to say that's different. It's in the same book of the Bible that our theme verse is in. It starts in John chapter 4. And I'm going to start reading in verse 3, and I want to encourage you, please do your best to follow along here, because this is going to be the, 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 the main passage that we use for the rest of the night. So if you miss this, you might miss a lot. So lean in and follow along. We'll take some breaks in there, and I'll try to explain some more things, but follow along as best you can. It'll be on the screen, uh, but follow along with me. John chapter 4, it says, Jesus, he had to leave Judea and return to Galilee. He had to go through Samaria on the way. Eventually, he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar, Sychar near the field that Jacob gave his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. Now, for those of you that were born in the 21st century, a well is a old school device that you get water from. It goes into the ground, you gotta get a rope and a buggy, you gotta like pull water out, it's miserable. I don't know why anybody lived like that, but that's what they used to do, all right? It says, soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, you are a Jew, 
and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Now, this is true. The more you look into this, the more you realize, of course, Samaritans and Jews, they did not mix together. They did not like each other. There was some genuine animosity there. And the fact that she's a woman and she's a Samaritan is extremely odd for Jesus to be talking to her. And we're not really going to focus on this part of the story tonight. Uh, It's not really the focus of the message. But there is something you need to understand about Jesus right from the jump. No one is off limits for him. I don't care who you are, what you've done, who your parents are. What you look like, act like, think like, sound like. If you're alive, Jesus is interested in you. That's good news. Let's keep reading. Jesus replied, If you only knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. Now this is funny because Jesus is the one who asked her for a drink. I'm not sure what kind of mind games he's playing here, but I have to imagine the girl is a little confused because in verse 11 she says, But sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket. And this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? She's clearly not getting it, right? She, she's trying to understand how Jesus could offer her water with one, he doesn't have a rope or a bucket to get it. And two, better water than this infamous well that she's getting water from tonight. But then Jesus replied and said what I think is one of the most important couple of phrases that have ever been stated in human history. He says in verse 13, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh, bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Now I want to read these two verses again because they are the heart of this story and quite simply the heart of this message. And so I want you to see this really clearly and I want you to get this as deep into your soul and your heart as possible. Verse 13, Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will soon be thirsty again. This water, the water at this well, the water that she's drinking from right now. Also, the water of this world, the water that you can get at Kroger, the water that you can get at your school, any source of water that you drink from this world, you're going to be thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give them will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. One translation says welling up to eternal life, almost as if it's about to overflow. So the woman replied, of course, please, sir. Verse 15, the woman said, give me this water. Then I'll never be thirsty again. I won't have to come here to get water all the time. Then Jesus, for some reason, gets a little personal and says, go and get your husband. And she said, I don't have a husband. And Jesus said, you're right. (laughs) You don't have a husband. For you have had five husbands and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. And then perhaps one of the most obvious responses, sir, you must be a prophet. Yes, yes, indeed. And Jesus goes on to teach her a little bit about worshiping God. That from now on, it's not going to be as much about where you worship God, but how you worship God. That that it's about how you worship in spirit and in truth. And after he gets done explaining all this, the woman's like, look, 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 look. I I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. Just then Jesus, his disciples came back and they were shocked to find him talking to a woman. But none of them had the nerve to ask, what what do you want with her or why are you talking to her? They, They were so shocked they didn't even think to ask what's going on. That's how big of a deal this was. But the next part, I love this, verse 28. The woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village telling everyone, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. And then later we read what happened as a result of this encounter in verse 39. Many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman had said, he told me everything I ever did. When they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in their village. So he stayed for two days, long enough for many more to hear his message and believe. Then they said to the woman, now we believe, not just because of what you told us, but because we have heard him ourselves. Now we know that he is indeed the savior of the world. I love this story because it's a beautiful example of life change and then overflow. A woman encounters Jesus, experiences living water, and it overflows out of her life into the people in her world. And we see a whole wave of people turn to Jesus as a result. Not to sound too simplistic tonight, but that's exactly what I hope happens at Access Conference this week. That you would encounter Jesus, experience his living water, and then go home and tell everyone you know about it. Jesus wants to give you living water. Something that truly satisfies your soul. Something that secures your eternity. Something that flushes out all the garbage that's filling you now. You may be thirsty tonight, and Jesus can satisfy your thirst. You may be empty tonight. 
Jesus can fill you with joy until you overflow. You may feel like an outsider tonight. Jesus wants to show you that no one is off limits to him. But to experience this overflow that we're theming the conference around, you have to first be filled with a source that doesn't run out or run dry. A source that truly quenches the longings and desires of your soul. You need to drink from the well of life. So I want you to ask yourself this question internally to yourself. Is my life currently overflowing with joy, with peace, with life? If the answer to that question is no, I think that's time to change. I think it's time for a change. So the question is, how do you fix this overflow issue? Remember, you can't overflow until you're filled in the first place. And here's what I believe God put in my heart about this message. Some of you aren't currently filled with life and satisfaction because the source you're drawing from is flawed. We all turn somewhere to find a sense of satisfaction and fulfillment. We're actually wired for it. We're made for it. You can't help but turn somewhere. You can't help but, but look for something that will bring some sense of life and satisfaction into your soul. You have to look for it. So every human alive is going somewhere for satisfaction. But the problem is, when the source you turn to is wrong, the satisfaction you receive from it doesn't stick. You have to keep coming back for more and more and more, and it just never seems to be enough. You're still thirsty. Could it be that that's where you find yourself tonight? You're drinking from the wrong well. Could it be that instead of turning to Jesus for life and satisfaction, you're turning to places that look good, sound good, feel good, but they're not quite good enough to do the job? With that in mind, I want to try something a little different tonight. For the rest of this message, I want to go in a bit of a unique direction. I, because coming into this week, I had this question burning in my mind. If young people don't turn to Jesus for life and satisfaction, where do they turn? If you're not turning to Jesus, where are you turning? And it led me to pray and, and study and, and come up with an idea. What I would like to do for the remainder of my time is do a little bit of a diagnosis. I want to see if we can identify some of the places we're tempted to turn to and why those places ultimately don't work. If you aren't drinking from the well of life, well, then what well are you drinking from? And I've got five of them. Five wells that I believe this generation is turning to instead of turning to Jesus. And for our purposes tonight, a well, a well, those old-fashioned devices, is going to represent any source you go to for satisfaction, for joy, for meaning. And I'm praying, here's what I'm praying that the Holy Spirit can use this simple illustration to get your attention and point you in the direction that's going to lead to life and life to the full till it overflows. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna name a well. I'm gonna describe what it is. I'm gonna talk about some of the side effects that come from drinking from this well, explain why it comes up short, and show you why the well of life is a better alternative. It sounds a little ambitious, but we're gonna try it, all right? So if you're taking notes, I want you to write down these wells, and I'm gonna use some of these screens to help us out a bit because they're beautiful, and um, let's just do that. So let's start right here and talk about this first well that we turn to for satisfaction. I'm talking about the well of fun and entertainment. This well is attractive. It's fun. Who doesn't wanna have fun and be entertained? What's in this well? Well, it's music, it's Netflix, it's social media, it's video games, it's sports, it's partying, it's the stuff that, well, sounds fun and entertaining. Anything that feeds our pursuit of laughter, enjoyment, pleasure, things that make us feel good, any source that gives us a sense of like, man, I like living. That's the well of fun and entertainment. And this source seems pretty innocent, right? What's wrong with having a little fun? On the surface, there's nothing wrong with doing things that we enjoy, so don't misunderstand me. The problem comes when we start turning to this well as a source for joy. And here's the problem with this particular world that we have to be mindful of. When it comes to the world of entertainment, this is a world that Satan dominates. He runs this world. He's in charge of that well. That's one of his favorites. He weasels his way into our movies, our music, our phones. In fact, I would say the influences of darkness have never been more easily accessible than they are today. And quite frankly, this is a well of distraction. The enemy uses this arena of our life to get us to focus on things that at best don't matter and at worst do damage to our souls. And let me explain something about these, these wells that I think is an important principle to understand. Again, what did Jesus say? If you drink from here, you'll be thirsty again. The problem with drinking from the wrong well is that you have to keep coming back for more and more and more and more. And the longer you drink from the wrong well, the more progressively sick you get. So for each well, I want to give you some side effects. 
with the hope that maybe they'll resonate with you and a, and a light bulb will go off and you'll say, oh, snap, I'm drinking from that well. Um, they're going to be a lot to write down. So I don't even know if you need to write them down, to be honest with you. I think you just need to hear them. And if they resonate and it's speaking to you, maybe you can jot some things down. But I just want you to soak this in because, again, I'm trying to do a little bit of a diagnosis tonight. I'm trying to see if the Holy Spirit can illuminate something in your mind, wake you up to the fact that maybe the reason you're so depressed and so anxious and so broken is because of the source you're drawing life from. So let me give you the first side effect. They all start kind of innocent. The first side effect of drinking from the well of fun and entertainment is this. You find yourself wasting a lot of time on things that don't add to your life. This is a sign that maybe you're starting to drink from this well. And look, we all do this, okay? So I'm not trying to act like don't ever waste time. We all do this. We get caught up in something that really isn't fruitful. It's not the end of the world, but it's not the best use of our life and our time. But the longer you drink from this well, the more your side effects progress. Here's what the second side effect is. Innocent entertainment turns into sinful behavior that feels fun for a season. So, so side effect number two is when we're going to start crossing into the sin threshold. Now your pursuit of fun isn't just something to pass the time with. You start partaking in activities that you know don't please God. Because it's fun and it feels good. But here's something you have to understand about sin. The Bible says that even sin is fun for a little bit. Oh, sin is fun. There's no doubt about it. Doing the wrong thing feels great sometimes. The problem is, if you stay there long enough, the fun runs out, and you got to keep going back to the well and back to the well, which leads you to side effect number three. Your addiction to fun and entertainment increases to levels that put your life in danger. This is when nothing is enough. It's something beyond sin. It's almost, it's, it's dangerous. It's, it's it maybe even illegal, a sign that you're, you're in this well way too deep. Your adrenal glands are shot. You're just trying to feel something, so you're doing whatever it takes to feel a little bit of life. But here's the deal. The well of fun and entertainment will not satisfy you because it offers a cheap version of what the well of life offers. And here's what you'll find with all five of these wells. Jesus offers a better version of each of the things we think we can get from these phony sources. Here's what Psalm 16 says. What a great verse. You, Lord, make known to me the path of life. And in your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. You know what that means? All the fun you need, all the joy you need, all the pleasure you need can be found in the presence of God. I know that seems hard to believe, but I'm telling you right now. Real joy, stuff that doesn't leave you in shame at night, the real kind of joy comes from the well of life. You can find all the joy and entertainment you need in the presence of God. Let's move on to this next well that is extremely popular. This is the well of love and sex. Now this well has a long line at your generation. Quite frankly, it may be the dominant well of our culture. And at its root, it's a desire to be loved in a close and vulnerable way. And we all want that. But what happens when we drink from this well is we start to stake the satisfaction of our life on the satisfaction of our latest romantic relationship. And this well progresses really quickly because it's intoxicating, it's addicting. You start drinking from this well and it's hard to stop. So how do you know you're drinking from this well? Well, side effect number one, you can't go an extended period of time without being in a romantic relationship. This might be a sign that you've started to drink from this well. You jump from relationship to relationship. If you're broken up for like three months, you start feeling like, does anybody even love me anymore? I gotta find, you settle for a relationship that's terrible just to be in one. That's the first sign that you might be drinking from this well. And at the root, look, I get it. It's a fear of loneliness. But you need to know that quite frankly, being single doesn't mean you're sick. It just means you're single. And um, you don't need a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a husband or wife, for that matter, to live in satisfaction. Hear me, your relationship status has absolutely nothing to do with your satisfaction status. And if you think it does, you'll never be satisfied. And you'll keep drinking from this well, and you'll get to side effect number two, where you start to compromise your convictions to gain the love and affection of another person through sex. Again, now we cross over into the sin threshold. Your need for love progresses to the point where you believe the lie that sex equals love. My friend, that is a lie. Sex and love are not the same thing.
Look, I don't have time to get into a relationship message, although I would love to. But I'll say this. Any person that tells you sex must be a part of your dating relationship does not have your best interest in mind. They have their own. That's a fact. And I'll take it a step further. I'll take it a step further. The progressively lowering standard of sexual purity and holiness within Christian relationships is astonishing. And it does not honor God. It doesn't matter what year it is, what culture says, what's normal, what everybody else thinks. God's word is still the authority when it comes to sex and sexuality. And, it's, and he still has a standard for the church. In fact, I... I'm tempted to just stay in this world the whole time because it's such an issue. It's so gripping. And the standard, unfortunately, has gotten so low in the church that you don't see purity hardly anywhere. But listen to what the Bible says. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 says, run from sexual sin. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does for sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. Don't you realize that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? Listen to this, young people. Your generation needs to know you do not belong to yourself. It's not, it's not your body. You don't belong to yourself. When you become a Christian, you say, God, you have my body. I don't have authority over this anymore because I've laid my life down and made you Lord. This is why sexual sin is so dangerous because you take control back from God. And if you're in this place where you're drinking from this well and you're compromising in this area, you, you, you need to know God loves you. He's not mad at you. He's not like, get them away from me. He just wants to offer you something so much better. Flee from this well before it continues and you find yourself in side effect number three where you've thrown off every spiritual and moral restraint and you've normalized sin, perversion, dishonesty, and immorality and now you're overwhelmed by shame. Some of you are in this place tonight. You've just gotten to the point where you just do whatever. Whatever you think feels right in the moment, you're just gonna go with it. But you know, and I know, that when you're by yourself and you really sit there in the presence of God, you feel a sense of, what am I doing? This is not making me happy. I'm not experiencing joy from this. It's actually making me miserable. It's making me sad. God has something so much better for you. See, you think this well will give you the love that you crave, but it won't. It'll keep coming up short again and again and again, and you'll have to drink, keep drinking again and again and again. Instead, again, let's drink from the well of life because the Bible tells us God is love. There is no real love apart from him, and his love is perfect. There's no selfishness in his love. There's no deceit in his love. There's no inconsistency in his love. He has all the love you need, and he never abandons you. He never breaks up with you. He never dumps you. He never forgets about you. In fact, here's what Romans says. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the kind of love that you're looking for and you will not find it right there. Let's go to the next well. This is the well of accolades and achievement. And this is the well of success. Um, this is a great well. This is for the people that wanna win in life. They wanna do things well. They wanna succeed. And can I just say, that's a great thing. You should wanna do things with excellence. You should wanna do everything to the best of your ability because that honors God. If you're an athlete, be the best athlete you can be. If you're smart, make the best grades possible. If you have an entrepreneurial gift or a knack for social media or music or any other field, be the best at it. We need young people who love Jesus in every sphere of life. But this area becomes a problem when we start turning to it as a source of satisfaction. And this one's really tricky because it's a fine line. It's a really fine line. But if we're not drinking the living water Jesus is offering, it's going to leave us thirsty. So how do you know you're drinking from this well? Well, how about side effect number one? You find yourself running on empty because you've become consumed with impressing people more than pleasing God. This is a sign that all of a sudden some of those innocent, pure motives to succeed and, and do well in life have turned a little bit inward and a little bit selfish. And man, this is really easy. Really, pastors in the room, this is so easy to just, just make an ever so slight shift 
to go from I'm all about pleasing, pleasing God to mm, I hope they see what I just did there. That would, have been, that would be awesome if I got a little more followers, a little more clout, people thought highly of me. Very easy to slip into this. You let a healthy conviction to do things well turn into selfish ambition to make people think more highly of you. And this always ends in disaster because one of two things happens. You either run out of gas because you don't have the fuel to make it or you get too consumed with yourself. And the game never ends, so you keep drinking. And side effect number two, your obsession with success in your field takes up so much of your time and energy that your relationship with God and commitment to his house is non-existent. This is when something has superseded the priority of God in your life. And now there's no room for a connection with God. There's no room for the house of God. The, the sport, the grade, the career becomes the most important thing in your life. Slowly but surely, any fire and passion for the things of God starts to fade. But your relationship with God can't be an add-on. It's not a little thing that you kind of throw on the side to like make you feel happy sometimes. And like, at least I got this. At least I got my boy Jesus riding with me. No, 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 no. It doesn't work that way. If something else ever supersedes the position of Jesus in your life, you know you're drinking from the wrong well. And you fall even further away uh, and you have to go back and drink and you get to side effect number three that says your addiction to achievement causes you to be so self-centered that everyone and everything becomes something you try to leverage to get ahead. This is a dark place to be because this is when your life is all about you and your kingdom and your brand. Usually there's a little bit of materialism going on here. You might be a little obsessed with money, but ultimately at the heart of it, your life is all about you. And I'll tell you this, one guaranteed way to make your life miserable is to make it all about you. It doesn't work. It actually backfires. And here's the reality. Like I've said for the other couple wells, God offers something so much better than this. See, we think if we surrender our dreams and our plans and all the things we want to do to make our name known, that we're going to settle for something less than. I'm here to tell you that God offers you a purpose that actually means something, that actually matters. Because you weren't created to build your own kingdom, you were created to build his and God has a much better plan and purpose for your life than anything you can dream up. But the secret is, it's not about you. Here's what Ephesians chapter 2 says. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. You need to know something. God has good things for you to do. You want to you win, you want to succeed, you want to achieve. God has good things for you to do. You're not going to miss out on purpose. You're not going to miss out on opportunity. You're not going to miss out on achievement. You're just going to start doing something that actually matters. And how much more fulfilling is that? Drink from his well, and I promise you'll find something more meaningful than any accolade this world has to offer. Let's go to the next well. We're almost done, but maybe I haven't hit your well yet. This next one is the well of acceptance and approval. This one's really popular. Um, and it's a big one right now because it's a well of identity. Again, it, it's rooted in a logical place. Everyone wants to be accepted. And there's nothing wrong with wanting people to like you. Drinking from this well, though, is when you're driven by this desire and you think it comes from external sources. This is where social media can really put gas on the fire a little bit. It's also where the cultural pressure to bow to popular opinion comes in. But here's the problem with this well as a source. When we think acceptance and approval comes from fitting in with our peers, we have no chance to stand for truth in this world. We will always bow to what's popular because it's the least, least path of resistance and best chance to gain favor with people. And here's what I need you to know. Anxiety is a really big symptom of this well. Because we're so fearful of what people think that it drives us to do and say things we would never do or never should do. Anybody seen Inside Out 2? All right. I'm not going to spoil the movie, but that movie kind of preaches. I'm not going to lie. It's like, it's pretty good. Um, I'm not going to spoil it, but, but what a great example of how anxiety is a terrible leader. But it is a natural result when you drink from this well. Let's talk about some side effects. How do you know you're drinking from this well? Number one, you find yourself overthinking even the smallest conversations and decisions because of fear of what someone else thinks about you. This is something I know a lot of people struggle with. I mean, can I be honest? I struggle with this. What do people think about me? I'm thinking about it right now. What do people think about me? Is this shirt too baggy on me? Is everybody bored? Are we getting any, I, is this even landing? Like I'm thinking all these things at the same time, all right? And I'm not trying to earn approval right now. I'm just saying this is my inner thoughts. And if you sit in this for too long, it'll drive you crazy. It actually makes the problem worse. See, I have an issue with this because I'm kind of an awkward person. I would say if there's a scale from like smooth to awkward, I'm not all the way over here. It'd be hard to be up here if that was the case. I'm like, but I'm in that, I'm in that zone. 
I'm more on that side of the halfway point of smooth and awkward than I am on this side. And I don't always have the smoothest interactions with people. In fact, there's probably many of you here that have only had one interaction with me and it didn't go well. And so you've never talked to me again. And the problem is, it's because I overthink my awkwardness and it only makes me more awkward. Have you ever been there before where you're getting prepared for an interaction? You're like, I got to act like I'm kind of, what's up? You know, like, and you overthink it so much that it just makes it worse. And it's a vicious cycle and you just look even worse, even more awkward. If you can relate to that, we're going to have an introvert meeting right over here, and uh, we're going to try to do some prayer. We're going to get some pastors over and cast the demon of introversion out, all right? Um, here's what I've learned and had to learn and am continuing to learn. The freest you will ever feel is when you're free from the chains of caring about what everyone else thinks about you. Oh, that's the freest you'll ever feel. Oh. The sooner you stop caring about being cool, you finally get kind of cool and you get a little free, I promise you. But if you don't, you'll keep drinking from this well and side effect number two will hit. You intentionally change core parts of who you are and what you believe in order to be liked by others. I've seen this happen. Young people faced with a choice as even as clear as believe the Bible or be in this friend group. I can't lose my friends. Worship Jesus with passion or fit in with these guys. I, I don't, want to think, I don't want them to think I'm weird. And look, I, all, I know we all want friends. Loneliness is a terrible feeling. But you know what's worse than being lonely? Having friends who only like a fake version of you. That's exhausting. That's way worse. And you know what's even worse than that? What's worse than that is forsaking the truth altogether because it's too inconvenient to believe something that isn't popular. And can we be honest tonight? We believe a lot of things that are not popular. I mean a lot of things. If popularity is your goal, it's gonna be just about impossible to be a follower of Jesus. So you're gonna to have to make a decision. And the sooner you make it, the better. Because the longer you wrestle with it, you'll only frustrate yourself. Because you'll try, you'll try to live in two worlds. You'll try to be in with the cool kids, but also like, Jesus, I love you. And You'll have so many moments where you'll just make a little compromise here. Well, I, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily believe all the Bible, I, most of it, you know, like, you know, I, look, I, like in the Greek and the Hebrew, if you really study it, I don't even know if it's true or not. Like, you know, a man wrote it, like we found some manuscripts and like, how many translations has it been through? Like, uh, like, yeah, you try to, you try to find out. You try to find little cracks. You can kind of fit in like, I still love God, but I'm still cool with my friends. Make the decision right now. Choose this day whom you will serve. Make a decision at this conference. I'm either going to serve God or I'm going to serve, quite frankly, the devil. <laughs> Side effect number three, your drive to be accepted has led to crippling anxiety, depression, and a chameleon-like personality that keeps anyone from even knowing the real you. When acceptance is driving you, You'll not only start to be consumed with anxiety, you'll start, to, you'll start to change who you are in every single environment. You'll lose a sense of, you won't even know who you are anymore because you're trying to keep up the image. At church, you're like, praise. And then the next day at lunch, it's like, man, bleepity bleep this. And did you see, and it's like, and the next day you're on a day like, hey girl, come on, let's, let's go Netflix and chill. Like you're just jet bouncing around. And then you're back on Wednesday night, praise. There's no consistency. Because you're jumping from environment to environment and you're a chameleon, you can kind of blend in. I can blend in here like, hey, what's up? I'm cool, I'm not one of those weird Christians. I'm one of the cool ones that believes all the cool stuff. Which one are you gonna be? Who are you gonna be? Is your priority gonna be pleasing God? Or is your priority gonna be making as many friends as you can, being as well liked and approved of as you can? You know what's better than the acceptance and approval of people? the acceptance and approval of the God of the universe. When, when you drink from the well of life, you gain a pure love and, and a pure acceptance from the one who literally knits you together in your mother's womb. Man, if you've never read this verse, you need to read it. And you need to read it a lot, especially if you struggle in this area, especially if you're insecure, especially if you struggle a little bit with like, what do people think about me? Here's what it says in Psalm 139. God, you made all all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous, how well I know it. 
You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion. As I was woven together in the dark of the womb, you saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. How precious are your thoughts about me, O oh God. They cannot be numbered. What does everybody think about you? I don't know, but I know what God thinks about you. He thinks a lot of good things. A lot of them. You can't even number them. God calls you his own. He knows the number of hairs on your head. He knows everything about you. And guess what? He still loves you. That's some real acceptance and approval. The very fact that you're on this earth right now breathing air is because God wants you here. You are no accident. In fact, you know the Bible actually says that no human has ever been born because of human consent. You're not here because of a romantic night 15 years ago between two adults. You're here for one reason only. God Almighty wants you here. That's it. That's the only reason. Oh, man, I, I know. I talk to kids that are like, my parents say I'm the accident when I was, the, I was a whoopsie. No, you weren't. Maybe for them, but not for God. <laughs> it's so sad. People say that. It's crazy. Since God made you, what he says matters most. Okay, we're closing right here. One more well. This is the last well, and it's the well of escape and isolation. Now, this is a difficult well because it's a well that's rooted in pain. We don't really drink from this well to find joy. Typically, it's to run from pain. It's an escape. It's a way out. It's a way to numb. And if you're drinking from this well, my guess is it feels like even an ounce of joy feels very far out of reach. It could very well be a substance you're abusing, something you're smoking, and alcohol you're drinking regularly and hardly anybody knows. It's possible it's self-harm or some kind of eating disorder. When the pain we feel is severe enough, we'll take any relief we can get. But hear me very clearly. This well is not your friend. This well is not here to help you. It's not going to make it better. The solution to your pain is not numbing it. It's not hiding it. It's not isolating yourself. In fact, that only makes the situation worse, worse which, which leads to some side effects. Number one, you start to withdraw from people and avoid social interaction as much as possible. This is one of the first things that happens to a lot of us when we experience pain because we just retreat. We don't want to be around people. We don't want to have to put on any sort of front and act like everything's okay. Instead, we just get ourselves alone. But unfortunately, being alone is one of the absolute worst things you can do for your pain. Because it often leads to coping mechanisms and you turn to side effect number two, you turn to a substance, a drink, or harmful activity as a way to numb or forget about your pain. And I know it might feel like it brings temporary relief, but you won't ever use or partake enough of that substance to make it go away. You'll only build up your tolerance and you'll need more and more and more and you'll quite literally have to keep returning to this well. And it'll just get worse and you might find yourself here at side effect number three. You're in a place of full-blown addiction and seriously wonder if your life is even worth living anymore. This is a scary and dangerous place to be. But here's the good news. You don't ever have to go back to this well again. You don't ever have to go back to it again. Jesus can set you free and he can give you something so much better. Here's what you need to know about the well of life. It doesn't make things perfect, but you can find healing. In fact, it's in your worst moments that Jesus comes closest. Psalm 34 verse 18 says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. See, yes, we should turn to the well of life, and uh, the well of life for joy and satisfaction, of course, but we should also turn there for comfort and healing when we're feeling pain because no one understands your pain like Jesus. Isaiah 53 says he was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows acquainted with the deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weakness he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins, but he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be made whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. Young people, here's the deal. Not a single one of these sources can save you, heal you, or set you free. Not a single one can bring everlasting life and joy and peace that fills you up to overflow. And I want to invite you tonight on the first night of Access Conference to walk away from these wells and like the woman that we read in the story, just leave your jar there and never come back. It's time to try something new. It's time to drink from a new well. There's a well that never runs dry, a source that always satisfies. It's the well of life and it offers living water.
you drink this water tonight, you'll never be thirsty again. Psalm 34, taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, the joys who take refuge in them, in him. So as we close tonight, we bring down this well of life. Let's answer the question, how? How do I drink from this well? Because it sounds too good to be true. It sounds pretty legit. Like I, I, I was liking all those other wells, but this one sounds pretty good. All right, it's actually not that difficult. It starts by coming to a realization of where you are tonight. Are you drinking from some other wells? Are there sources you've been turning to that you realize are not filling you? That's what the whole point of this message has, has been, is, is I'm hoping that maybe some of you for the first time became aware that's the problem. It's not, it's not that I didn't have enough fun or entertainment. It's not that I didn't experience enough love and sex. It's not that I didn't get uh, enough accolades or achievement. It's not that I wasn't accepted or approved enough. It's not that I, I, I could escape. It's that I was drinking from the wrong source the whole time. And if you can come to that realization, you can make a very real decision to repent, which means to change your mind and turn in a different direction. And once you come to that awareness and you say, all right, light bulb went off. I see where I'm at now. I'm drinking from the wrong well. I want to fix this. God, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have been doing this. And uh, I, God, you're convicting me. You're, you're, you're drawing me to you. And I realize now that I am not drinking from the well of life. I'm not experiencing a life that's overflowing with joy and peace and purpose. I'm going to turn in a different direction. Now, it doesn't mean you're promising perfection. Of course, you're just acknowledging that you need him tonight. You need his help. And when you come to that place, the next steps are very clear in God's word. Romans chapter 10, verse nine. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Believe in Jesus, make him Lord. Believe in Jesus, make him Lord. You believe and you make him Lord. What does that mean? Okay, it means you have enough faith to believe that this might be real doesn't mean you have all the answers but you can find just a mustard seed of faith to say God I don't understand it all but I'm gonna put my faith and trust in you and then the response to that faith is to make him Lord to surrender and put him in charge what does it mean to make him Lord it means to put him first place it means instead of being in the car with you he's driving it instead of him being your consultant he's your king it means his way over your way and we, for some reason, instinctively think that this will restrict us or hold us back. We want to have autonomy over our own lives. We want authority over our own lives and our own direction, our own purpose. But what you don't realize is that you're restricting yourself because what God has for you is so wide open. In fact, I added this verse last night because I think so many people are afraid to surrender because they think they're going to be like, in a straight jacket like I, I don't get it. I'm just serving God I'm just here serving God it's kind of a bummer but I, I committed to serve God so I'm serving him here's what it says in John 15 when you obey my commandments you remain in my love just as I obey my father's commandments and remain in his love and then I love this I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy yes your joy will overflow you want to know how to get your joy to overflow do what God says. It's that simple. Obey the King of Kings. If you obey him, your joy will overflow. You want to know why? Because he's smarter than you. He knows what works. If you do what he says, he's like, finally, I've been trying to help you this whole time. What if tonight was the night you surrendered? said all right all right God I hear you I'm done with my ways I'm done with these wells I'm turning to you I want to invite you to make that decision but here's the thing that's always difficult about access conference in particular there's a lot of hype in the room can you tell I mean I can say make some noise and there'll be three people holding their ears because it's gonna be loud right it's just a lot of hype from the I mean from song one it was like whoa is this night four or night one it was like on and there could be a temptation to, in this moment, be like, oh, oh, yeah, Jesus. And that's cool, but 
I don't want you to make this decision because you feel like, man, it'd be kind of cool to make the decision here at tonight at Access Conference. Like everybody would see me and I'd be like, yeah, I'm, I'm down at the altar, like hands around your brothers, like crying, like, yeah, God. I'm not interested in emotionalism. I want, some, I want you to make a decision for real. Not like a, you know what, I could just use this as insurance just in case I'm like gonna go to hell. I don't wanna go to hell, so I might as well like make a fresh start. No, 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 no. I want you to make this decision because you're ready to surrender your entire life to him. I want you to count the cost.